No, go ahead. Go no, right go in. ahead. So, um, so let's start with a little bit about the biology of, of I'll be your straight man for a while. And uh, so let's get a little bit about the biology of queens. Like, for instance, like how long does it take one to be um, to eat close or emerge from a cell? You know, about 15, 16 days for a queen to come out. Bees take their time. They want to, they, they're going to pick through multiple cells. Um, when these choose, they tend to pick through and produce multiple cells, and then they'll pick through those cells and they'll let the bees pick, and then they'll refine their choice, and then they'll leave about five to eight cells on the frames or throughout the hive. And then what they'll do is after they let that occur, they'll create full queen cells. And uh, that is why we have swarms. We have swarms right, so now. You're, Go ahead. You're talking about um, the normal process that occurs in a colony during this time of year when a colony is about to swarm, right? Right. So everyone goes into their hive and they find these long, like they define it more as a peanut shape, but they're, they're, they're pretty long wax shaped queen cells and everyone looks for them and everyone's terrified of touching them and taking a look at them more closely, but uh, you take that and a couple extra frames and you have... Uh, we lost you. A lot of people early. So you lost me? Yeah, but we're good now. Okay. And so queen cells are formed. This is the season for them. And so if you're paying attention to your hive now, you're probably seeing queens jumping out of the hives and swarms and finding them in a tree. <laughs> And so we're running around catching these swarms even in our own field. And today we've even had four of them. And while we're trying to produce queens at the same time, we're trying to grab these swarms and putting them in a box and allowing them to do what they need to do and trying to figure out which box they're from. And that never seems to work for us. And we never stay yeah. ahead of them. So, um, so what you're talking about is what um, we refer to as a prime swarm that comes out this time of year. Right. So this, yes. yeah. So explain a little bit about um, what queen, what, that, what that's a mated queen, right? Mark, that's a yes, mated so queen. Yes, so typically it's a mated queen. It's from last a, year. Uh, daughter. Yes, it's a, uh, a prime mother basically leaving the hive that is already mated from last year and is leaving the hive. Uh, right. The other side of this is that it could be a daughter, and the daughter can already be mated, or sometimes is a virgin and does leave the hive, and a swarm of bees leaves with her. Yeah. And they'll yeah. end up hanging on a tree, and sometimes I'll put them in a box, and that queen does not get mated. And that swarm just never fruitions into a hive, and so we'll find out that those bees just followed her for no reason. And they end up either dispersing into another queen or we end up putting another queen cell in that box so that we could use those bees for purpose for other basically another another new yeah. but that queen never gets mated for some reason and so it could be weather like for the last week connecticut had that cold wet weather so there was no mating going on so there's the, there's delays that occur and they only have about 32 days to mate and after that there's no more mating going on and so that queen becomes useless or she becomes what's called a drone layer where all she will lay is void. And that queen becomes useless because that will never produce a, a, a hive that's going to produce honey because if she's only going to produce drones, she is only producing one side of the genetic platform and those queens the, uh, losing. produce any fur. Bees will tend to destroy those queens. The connection? Yeah, this connection's a little bit uh, shaky at times. But anyway, so let's let's go back over that because that's an important point that um, in the biology of queens. So when a queen comes out of a cell as a virgin, and and assuming that she is chosen by the colony to be the one that's going to lead the colony, she goes on to be. Um, she she becomes she matures a little bit once she comes out of her cell a retinue of, of bees form around her, and then she goes on her mating flights. But if for some reason, as you mentioned, in that window, she exceeds that time limit, like you said, it was 32 days or so, 
I, you know, I've seen it a little bit, I've even seen it less than that. She will never really make that point. So they have their biological window that they have to get mated in and lay and start laying. And if they don't meet that, they, they're, they're not productive queens. And that can happen. It does happen. You know, so it could happen naturally and um, for, for whatever reason. And um, or if you get involved in it in some way and you delay that process, you can end up with a queen that won't get mated. Like trying to bank a virgin or something like that. Correct. There are also queens that there will be a day of good weather. They'll go mate. They'll mate with maybe one or two drones and they'll come back and they'll look like they're successful. But they will probably lay about two months of eggs. And after that, they'll just peter out and be drone layers. Yeah. Because they've had two days of, or a day or two of mating, and that's not enough. Typically, a queen needs a minimum of seven to 10 drones to be a, a successful queen. Anything less than that, and she won't make it into the winter. Yeah. So, so that's a, that gets at the, at the, um, at the season of the year when you're trying to mate queens. Like for instance, right now, if you're trying to mate naturally mated queens, virgin queens are flying out to get mated, they may not find the, uh, the drone population that they need to be thoroughly uh, fertilized. Is that, is that what, when do you think that that time, in your experience, when do you think that time is in Connecticut when you can successfully mate a queen? So I always look at when there's a pattern of drone cells that are already sealed. That's when we can start producing queens. So we produce queens now, but we right already about, have drones. Right, right about, about now. Right. Yep. This is the time when we can go ahead and start grafting. And grafting is a process of uh, producing queens, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. But once I start seeing drones, drones start to fly out. I uh, look at what time they basically fly out because they go out on their mating ritual at about yep. two to four o'clock and uh, drones fly out every single day to, we call it the bar, um, but they fly out to their mating location every single day. And it's the same location, I guess, every day they get mated. And if they don't get mated, they return back to the hive and I keep seeing deviations from them. So we'll mark drones in a specific hive and we'll see them come back to a totally different hive. Yeah, they, they, yeah, 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 it happens all the time. All right. so. Um, so let, let's take a few questions now. We'll just take a few on, on the natural process, the swarm process, which we just described, where you know, a colony will begin to, there's a wonderful flow of nectar out there. The colony is healthy, it's overwintered, and they begin their reproductive process by making new queens. That's what you described earlier um, about how they go through that process of actually selecting the cells they want to go forward with to make queens during swarm season. And then the colony swarms, takes the mother queen with them, and 30, 45, 50% of the bees leave with her. And behind in the colony are those maturing swarm cells, which will uh, develop into virgin queens. They'll have a fitness contest. And then uh, one of those will win and become the, the queen of that colony. So let's take a few questions now on that process, the natural swarming process, and then we'll get into how you graft and the rest of the stuff you do so marvelously. So I wanna open it up now for some questions on what you might be seeing right now, swarm system for in, in swarm season. Nada? Well, hang on one second. We're not that good. I know that. Okay, I'll back off. <laughs> I I have a question, Bill. Sure. Hey, ready. Tim, how are you? I'm doing all right. Doing all right. Um, let's say you uh, you're starting to see some eggs in queen cells, uh, even some larvae. Nothing super developed yet, and you make a, a walk away split, and you don't bother to sort out whether or not like. Like the, the split with the queen in it, even if it has some of those swarm cells, is what's the likelihood that that, that split will actually still swarm? Oh, you mean a sort of like 50-50 split where you don't care where, where the queen is? Yeah, exactly. Well, one side will be queenless and the other side will have the queen 
And that's an that's an old school way of doing it. Uh, Mark, what do you think about a 50, about that kind of a 50? That's so what Tim is, let me see if I can paraphrase Tim for the audience, is that he's suggesting that you go up to a colony, maybe it's in two deeps, you're seeing eggs and maybe larva in some queen structures, little cells. Uh, and you don't really want to take the time to figure out where the queen is or where she isn't. And you just split the colony in two boxes. Is that right, Tim? Basically? Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, and then I'm actually throwing, I'm using mediums, but it's the same thing. So I'm, I have, yeah. it's four mediums. I, I split them in two and I'm throwing a third with, with foundation. I mean, with a drawn comb on top of each one. Okay. So but I'm not, but I'm not looking to make sure that I get all the swarm cells, like, you know, like even once I see eggs laying, once I like if I come back a few days later, I see eggs. I'm not you then know, like destroying, I'm not destroying swarm cells. So I'm yeah. just wondering, like, is there still a likelihood of that hive could swarm? Yes, there's still a likelihood of that hive swarm. There is nothing wrong with experimentation. The one no. thing you have is if you're just going to take uh, two mediums or two deeps and split them, is you're going to have one with a queen. And even though there's going to be cells left in there, the virgins are going to come out. They're going to take that hive and potentially split that leftover hive with the old queen and a new queen. The other hive that you have is going to be queenless. And when they get a queen and it's going to be a virgin, you're looking at a minimum of the up to potentially 16 days from the day that you're going to have that production of that queen, plus up to 30 days for the mating process and her to start laying. So you're looking at almost 45 days to start a new hive compared to, let's say, it, it, you're, you're literally waiting for that cell to mature. And as long as you're watching it, there are ways to be able to block off that virgin queen cell from that, from that queen. So, so you could prevent that queen from moving further away from that cell. So if you watch it every day, there are covers you can use and Bill probably has seen them better than I have, that you basically just, it's a push-in type of peg that blocks that virgin from walking away from that cell. And if you can find that, she's live. And then you basically start the countdown of three or four days, but you can take that frame with that queen, move it to a new, new, new um, a nuke box or another box, or just take that whole box, move it to a new location and split it apart. Then you're playing this balancing act because you have old bees flying back to the old location from the box that you've moved. And so you kind of have a little bit of balancing, but it is the old way of doing it and it does work. It just requires a little bit more active management. So Tim, that doesn't, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe that I, what I, what I like to do is a little bit something different than that. I understand that the tendency, and I know a lot of, commercial beekeepers will just will just do those 50-50s and just walk away from them. But if you take a little bit more time to manage, as I think as Mark is talking about, to manage the swarm cell piece where you identify swarm cells, put them in the split, uh, or make a strong side split. In other words, your split, you you leave the the um, original location without queenless. And the split location, that's where you put the queen, usually because they end up with the full field force, and, but they don't have a queen. But their chances of making a queen is much better than the, than the split would be if it was left on its own. So that's the only reason. That's the only way I could see you can modify that to make certain you're maybe caring for the, um, the, the field force a little bit differently. Anyway, what else? Well, I have a question. Uh, you know, in, in 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 terms of preventing the swarms, uh, many people place a heavy emphasis on giving the bees more room and more room, and more room, as a as a way of preventing it. But can you talk a little bit about the effect of some other factors, uh, particularly on, on swarming, particularly uh, the presence of open, uncapped brood uh, and the hormones that they release and the signals that they give to the bees and the effect that that has on their uh, tendency to swarm. 
Mark? In our field, the minute we go into a box and we see not swarm cells, but we see drone cells being filled up, that is my first signal that the bees are getting ready to swarm. Because the minute I see capped drone cells, you can take that box and put 10 high, they're leaving. <laughs> no matter how many times I have tried this, no matter how many times I have taken it in different locations, the minute they put drone cells out, they are ready, aim the fire, they're going to make queen cells, if they are producing boys, if they're going to mate and leave. And that is their whole process. And people try to say that they do not want to have swarms out. And basically, you're just losing bees. You're just giving away $175 of bees every time that's hanging on a tree with a queen. I mean, Bill may have a different opinion of it, but... Well, I mean, you're, you're saying, what you're saying is, and I agree, uh, there's only one uh, criteria under which a colony will build drone cells and that's if it's he healthy. And there's gotta be a lot of resources around. It has to be pollen and there has to be um, a flow. And so when you do see, and that's exactly right. Now, I look a little earlier than that because sometimes I don't see, um, you know, what I think Jose is referring to is people have said, well, as long as you give them space, you can keep them from reproducing. But I don't believe that is entirely true, Jose. You know, um, right. That's what I'm saying. That you know, so many people think that that's the only, uh, you know, that's that's almost a sure way of preventing swarms. But I was I was trying to get at uh, uh, something else that is uh, the extent to which, you know, they might have enough room in there. Uh, they might not need to leave because they're crowded. But uh, to the extent uh, that they have open brood in there, eggs, uh, young larvae. Uh, and, and those are producing certain hormones that yep. they are releasing into the hive. And that is one of the signals that uh, will spur them to get into swarm mode. And I was wondering if we could talk about that aspect of it. Well, from, you know, so there's, there's lots of um, pheromonal uh, signals that occur in a colony during the swarm season. One um, in particular is a, a pheromone that is, actually transferred from the foraging bees back into the bees in the colony. When a lot of that comes back into the colony, the colony has a tendency to think at that point that there's, there's lots of field resources out there. That usually is an indication where they want to start building, reproducing. So there, is, there are signals that occur between foraging bees and the colony nurse bees that say, hey, let's get on with this building um, swarm cells and so on and so forth. So the natural urge to reproduce is a difficult urge for any beekeeper to try to control. And as it can't just be done by, um, by putting on more space on a colony. It's a complicated combination of, as you mentioned, brood and natural resources when those two combine, lots of brood, lots of bees, drone, cap drone cells, as Mark is saying, the bees will fly. You know, so that's that's just a, a fact. And so if you can put supers on early, but my my guess is that if your colony doesn't swarm when you put supers on, it's not causation. You know, it's it's more of um coincidence <laughs> that that colony might not have swarmed that year. They, they will also stay in the box, even though you've given them many more boxes. But what they'll do is they'll produce these knockoff swarms, which will be smaller. They'll be one, one and a half pounds yeah. of bee with a queen and they'll just disappear. And you won't even see the difference because of the, the massive amount of bees that's in the hive. Yeah. And you'll see them either locally around, the, around your own apiary or you'll see them because all of a sudden you'll go, where's this coming from? And that's going to be the hive that's going to be sending them out because it's just a natural tendency. And genetically, we can't take it out because if we do, we're on the road to extinction and these won't produce. 
Mark, can I ask a question about uh, drone comb removal in conjunction with your theory that once you see drones, the hive's going to swarm? What's the impact of drone comb removal on that process? In our field, we don't believe in drone comb removal. I still think people need to treat for varroa. And if, you, if you're in a position like now and you're, you have two boxes, the two boxes deep and you're pulling frames apart from the lower level and you're ripping the frame from the lower level because they've built in between those yeah. two frame yeah. levels, you need to be looking down there and seeing if there's varroa because those are drone cells that you can literally see varroa. Um, I no, I'm, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about drone comb between frames. I'm talking about the Pierco green frames, the full yeah. frame, removing the full frame and freezing it and then putting it back uh, in the hive. Yeah, we're we're um, no, remove them, freeze them. Go ahead. So I think what I think Alan try to interpret Sorry, what I think Ralph is asking is if he's got a drone frame in there, like a green drone frame or a whole frame of drone. Um, does that, if he removes that frame, does that knock off the balance um, on your theory of looking for uh, drone comb for swarms? Um, that's right, Bill, thank you. Yeah, yeah, but that's, but, but, but no, I don't think that, that that would, Ralph. I think that they still have drones in other places. Um, no, you got to try that and really figure out. Yeah, I think well, in, in you got to try that, Ralph. In my experience, um, there's not a lot of drone cells in the hive when you put a full uh, frame, uh, for instance, the Pierco green frame. There's, there's not a lot of other drones in the, they're not, they're not laying drone cells because they're going to that frame. Yeah. And, and they found some kind of balance. Yeah, they found some kind of balance between the drones they need in that colony and the space they have to put them in. And that, like Mark was suggesting earlier, you know, when you don't, we try to force bees into, into brood comb all the time to let queens to lay. Right. So they find these really creative ways to, to construct drone comb and they put it between the boxes. And then you have to rip that all apart when you try to do your inspection. So that's what folks are seeing now. What they're seeing is that bees are responding to the amount of drones they need by finding space anywhere they can to make drone cells. And they, they make them horizontally, if you notice that, the way that they make them on the bar. Um, it's kind of interesting. But it's a little bit of a pain because it glues them together pretty strong. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the bottom bar of the top frame and the top bar of the bottom frame is glued together you know pretty good well ralph um that's a great question coming from sunny california sure is where swarm season started a month and a half ago <laughs> yeah all right great anything else before uh, mark is going to go to the second stage of this which is where he's going to talk about uh the procedure of grafting which would be now um you know, switching gears from sort of a natural uh, swarm tendency to how does he take advantage of the uh, biology and raise queens um, by using uh, his methods of grafting and then artificial insemination, which we'll talk about after that. So um, unless there's any other questions on regular swarm Stuff will go back. We'll, we'll have Mark explain a little bit about what the process of grafting is. Yeah, I got a question. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, has anybody seen swarm so far this year in the local area? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's swarms out. Um, I think Paul. Paul, you had a swarm just recently, right? Was it yesterday or the day Monday. before yesterday? I had, I had a Monday morning, eight o'clock. <laughs> but that was an easy one, right? It was right at a tree it, or something? No, it was, it was right on a, on a uh, picnic table. <laughs> okay. About, about 20 feet away. Yeah. And I, I would have had one today, late this afternoon or, 
or tomorrow morning if I didn't intervene and cage the queen. So, um, so yeah, no, there, this is, I'm suggest, you know, two days of rain, cold weather, followed by sunshine, and even in the 50s or 60 degrees, at that point, if they're, if the colony was building cells and you didn't notice it, they're going to swarm in the first, um, the first time, especially if those swarm cells are capped, first chance they get after the weather clears a little bit, they're going to swarm. Agree with that, Mark? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right, let's move on then. Let's talk a little bit about grafting. Okay, so the most important part of queen rearing, which I teach, is grafting. And if you can learn grafting, you can make queen. Uh, or everything else in queen rearing is manipulation of hives and the material in hives so that the bees will give you the results you're looking for. Grafting is very important because basically you're taking a frame that is built out the queen has laid her eggs, and you're looking 24 hours later for larva that is basically graftable. And basically, that is a tool that we go into the cell, grab that tiny, tiny, tiny larva that you could just barely see, and transfer that to a little plastic cup that goes on a strip of wood. And we basically graft as many as we can, as quickly as we can, onto that piece of wood, which is basically a bar. And we put three of those onto a frame. And we give those back to a hive that is full of baby bees or young bees. The older bees tend not to hang around and there is no queen in this box. And so when we make that box queenless, we basically tell the bees that they need a mom. And so they make all the moms we're looking for. And so the best way to do that is we, we take a nuke box, and the most important components they need is baby bees, water, sugar, and a protein source, which of course for bees is pollen. Once they have those components and they have no queen, they're going to take all the larvae that I have just put in those little plastic cups and they're going to make all the queen cells that I'm looking for. The most difficult part that I see have classes is trying to transfer the larva from the frame to the cup. It takes okay. a little bit of practice. Just like now, let me just, I'm going to share a screen that shows a little bit of that process. Everybody see that? Can everybody see this? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so yes. Mark, you can see it also, right? Of course. So is so that's a so maybe in on the right hand side over here you can you can uh, talk a little bit about that grafting tool that's the tool you were talking about and below it is the whole process of where people are trying to graft right so they're taking so, so Bill if you look on your screen it's the third row down the second photo in the cream colored image click on that one so they can see that one this no, one, no, here? The one that's uh, above that the cream colored background. The one above it. Okay. This one here. To the right. That one? That one. That one. Well, that one. Yes, I think it gives everyone a better idea of how that works. Yeah. All right. So um, maybe you can explain that. Like, like step one, you're putting the graph. Now, do you find that it's uh, this is a difficult part for people to learn? Is that is that what you're saying? So typically, this is the most difficult. And in our, and when I teach this, this is the part that everyone struggles with, is doing this exact step. Everything else seems to be very easy, and when everyone's yeah. able to do it. Um, but it's understanding how to graft and not damage the larva, and making sure you pick the right frame, and then making sure that once you pick the, you know, pick up the larva, you transfer it so that it does not get damaged. And okay. I always tell our students. Always graft with the largest larva first that you can see, and then work your way down. Okay, so so you're not going to actually try to make queens with that with that. Um, you're just practicing at that point. I always tell people what, it, what whichever one you could see first, try to transfer that. If it's too big, I'm going to tell you right away. So I always tell our students that if you look at a circle, cut it in half. Look for that first. And then, so if you're seeing a half, a C, a basically a C cut, you know, a circle, yeah. basically a full circle cut in half. If you're seeing that C, find the C, graft that. And then if you're comfortable grafting that, that 
find a smaller one. Keep going backwards to the smallest one you can find before you get to the egg. Don't touch the egg. So, so you this, really this is in the just showing how to do this step by step. Go ahead. Well, so so how do you prevent, say, for instance, when you're using this grafting tool, how do you prevent just it pushing right through the mid rib on the and the hive? Why does it bend around like that? So the tip of the tool. Go ahead. I, the way I see it is step one: the grafting tool is fully extended. It's hard to see in the, in the diagram, but right in here is a little plastic piece, right? Correct. Yep, that plastic then, piece slides under the larva. And it goes and around and slides under the, larva. under the larva. Right. Correct, that's the royal jelly. And then, and then once, and in step three, if you get it to this point, you've won the battle of learning how to graft, if you can do that really um, proficiently. And then you just pull it out, right? Yeah, if you haven't made sausage by then, you'd pull it out with number three. <laughs> and then when you, wherever you're gonna put it into a cup, a special cup, right. which, which is what, you've, what we're gonna talk about, right? Or you, you did already. You're gonna put that larva into a special queen cup. And that's what it's shown in step four. Six million members of the Indian diaspora here in the United States. Okay, Today, somebody's, somebody's got their radio on. Many are All right, thank you. All right, so that's the process of then putting it in the cup. Is that right? Correct. That's the cup, that's a bar, and that's a metal tool. Metal tool yeah. seems to be a little bit more complex for students, and they, they're coming up with much better tools now compared to when I started in this 10 years ago and they showed me methods, and I'm going, yeah, this isn't going to work. All right, so that's the bar. We'll talk a little bit about... Um, how you establish that. Now I've sort of highlighted this, this area here. That's the size of the larva that they grafted in this case. Um, right. I think that larva is going to survive that one there, Mark, or did they? Did I they, think it needs a they, little bit more royal jelly around it or they're going to make <laughs> a little bit more damage. <laughs> All right. So, um, so what else do we need to show on this uh, particular uh, grafting piece here so that... Um, so that uh, means... You know the image where it says graft honeybee larva for queens? It shows them the background, which is that shiny milky image, which basically would, we could talk about that. So this, so this image, yes. So this image shows the frame. And if you look really carefully, you could see that these larvas are slightly bigger than normal. The one that's about in the center to the right of the center is probably the right size. But if you look at them, they're filled with a slightly milky substance. And the more of it that there is, the better or the more lubricating the action will be when you're trying to pull these out. Yeah. And so the way to get a hive to this point is you need to make sure that they have pollen, which we feed, or they have it naturally, and you are feeding the hive a syrup. And when a hive is fully fed and actively sourcing pollen, this is the kind of hive you're going to see, and this is the kind of cells you're going to see in these hives. And when you see this, that means your hive is extremely healthy. And so even previous to this, you're going to see eggs, dry eggs, but there's an example of a, a perfect, you know, royal jelly with a, with a larva ready to be. Uh... So I circled that one uh, larva. It, now that's too big, that's too large, correct? To graft. The one to the, the one to the left is good for practice, but the one to the right is just the right size for yeah. queen rearing. So just so people can get it, that there's um that the actual larva that they're going to graft is just about a day old. I mean, it's just right after the the best. The earlier you can get them after the egg, sort of we refer to it as hatches, but really the egg just like lays over on its side and becomes. Um, the first instar larva. That's really the one that you want to grab to graft with. After a couple of days, um, they're no longer queens if you graft them. They're, Correct. In, they're intercasts. So you have to use the right age larva. Correct, Mark? Is that right? Yes. If, you, if you take something that's too old, it will be an inferior queen. And right. you can produce inferior queens, and they'll last you about nine months and it'll work but you'll have a 
Brony or Queen. She won't be as big because right. she does not have enough of the material necessary for a queen to pre-produce the right size. And they'll take care of her, but they'll try to replace her. Yeah. All right. Anything else you want to see on here before we move on? No, I think that's good. All right. So let's uh, ask I have some... a question. Yes. Let's let's sure. ask some questions about grafting. Just go ahead. Yeah, Bill, is this is uh, Jack Grimshaw? Hey, Jack, how uh, are you? Excuse me. This is good. This is this is my first Zoom, so I'm I'm kind of winging it here. Uh, okay. I wanted to ask Mark how he set up his cell starter. If he uses a, a cloak board, or he mentioned a nuke, uh, uh, what's what's he do for a good cell starter, and then maybe discuss a cell builder. Okay, great, so, great suggestions, Jack. Thank you. So there's, there's many different cell starters. Um, we use cloak boards. We use the nukes, the five frame nukes that we basically put in uh, baby bees into. I, we like cloak boards because I can actively start the cloak, basically use the cloak board in a way where it's on and it's off and it's on and it's off. Um, it just depends if I'm teaching. Usually I'll show people how to use the, the five frame nuke. And uh, we manipulate those so that basically we cut out the side and we glue down netting or a, um, a frame so that basically they get access to water and air. So there's a little bit more air transfer going through it, but you will, you can build them. I've seen people build all kinds of new five frame nukes with air going through the bottom, air going through the top. I've seen them made out of mesh. I like the cloak board, the five frame. Um, there are times where they, we would just have just the cell starter and we would just keep adding frames of, of um, basically frames of brood to it just to keep it going. So it just depends on what kind of how much you're producing at a time. The cloak board does work if you're consistently producing queens. If you're trying to produce 20, 30, 40, 50 queens, usually we teach, we teach our students to, to basically do a five frame nuke with no queen. And each frame is going to be a different material. And then the center is going to be for your queen. And they right, will so, produce them even. Go ahead. So, so just, let's just back up for the folks that are, um, that are new to this and explain what a cell starter actually, why is it that you can, bees will draw out queen cells, lots of them. And this, so the principles are, as I heard you say, is the cell starter is queenless. Yes. Yeah. Now, if there's a queen in there, or one gets in there, right? <laughs> then Which they do. They'll, they'll destroy every one of the, they'll destroy all your hard grafting work, right? Because they'll they'll destroy all the queen cells that are up there, right? In your graft. So you have you're you're saying you teach people to use a five frame nuke box. Yes. Got a lot of bees in it. There's about three pounds of bees, yep. Yeah, so that's a lot for a little new box, right? Three pounds of bees. So <clears throat> it's stuffed with bees, nurse bees, hopefully. Yeah, yeah anything you shake into a nuke box that stays in the new box. Is a queen, is a, is, a, is a nurse bee, <laughs> right. Anything that right. flies out is too old, we don't want it. We don't want it. <laughs> How much brood is in there? What is that, um, what's so the rest of it look like? Going there's going to be one frame of sealed brood. There's going to be a frame of pollen and honey. Yeah. Another frame of pollen and honey. A frame of just an, uh, basically an empty frame. So they have something to do. And then the center frame yeah. is for your queen. All right. So, so, the, so the actual cell starter has a configuration that you have to follow, including with, with the bees. But so there's got to be food there. For them to raise yes, queens and so on and so forth. It's not, you can't just shake three pounds of bees in a box of, of drawn comb, drawn empty comb. It's not right. likely to work as a starter unless you've given them, you know, the frames of pollen and so on and so forth. So then you're going through the process we talked about. You're grafting all of those uh, cells into cups and you, you, you attach them to a bar on a frame and you slip them in to your cell builder. Correct. On top of that, we throw in we throw in pollen on top, and we throw in fondant on top. Okay. And then we make sure there's enough water in there for them. Okay. And then we close them up. All right. 
And then what do you do? How long do you wait? I give them two days, 48 hours. And? When I go in there after 48 hours, we either have a virgin that we have to look and kill because they did not produce what I wanted them to produce. And virgin got in there somehow where there's a queen in there or they produce all the queen cells I wanted. And I take a look at them, I inspect them, I put them back in, I close it up, and then I open the bottom of the nuke, the white plastic nuke. I open up the bottom so they can leave because they're not going anywhere, so that they can access to go to the bathroom if they need to, because two days is enough to be locked up. And yeah. I let them finish those queen cells. In our operation, we have incubators. We have com commercial incubators. So at the fourth or fifth day, once those queen cells are capped, they're removed from that box, brushed off lightly, and they go into an incubator and I can do it again. So then, okay, so, so you're doing something different. So in your little nuke box, there's no way for you to put a queen excluder on the front of that so a virgin can't fly in there and destroy all your yeah, but Typically they won't, after, once the queen cells are built up, even if there is a virgin, the bees will still continue to produce those cells. Yeah, okay. So what Mark is explaining is that sometimes in his queen operation, right, he, um, a virgin will, there's lots of queens flying around oh, this time of year. And one can go in the colony and, and raise hell, um, where he's trying to raise his queen. So then you take your, your grafted cell bars, which have capped cells, you take them out of there. So you don't have to invest a whole, a whole amount of time that normal people <laughs> would have to, um, you can put them in your commercial box, keep them nice and warm. Is the humidity controlled in that box also? Uh, in the box, it, there is a, the front of the, the, or the side itself, we cut out an area where we could put a mesh on the side so they can control their own amount of humidity and heat. Oh, so you don't heat that box? Oh no, they produce so much, they produce more than enough heat. They need cool. They, they need, need ventilation. Need be, they need more ventilation than they need heating. Okay. All right. So, and then you will put um, hair curlers, rollers on the top of those. How do you how do you keep the queens from uh, coming out then? So once once we have those queen cells after four days, so the queens are not ready and they go into the incubator. Right. I have I have my kids, which will take them and move them over, and basically put each cell into a queen cage, allowing that queen as she comes out to go straight into a cage okay. for me. Instantly. All right, so that's how you're, you're keeping your queens, uh, mm -hmm. your queens from flying away, <laughs> from, from coming yes. out and destroying yes, all the rest of each other too, right. So now you've got a bunch of queen cages with, um, with the virgins in them. Yes. What's your next and step? So, and then you can, so, for, then you can put another uh, grafting bar in that starter. Yes, and because there's, I also put a frame of brood in there, I can probably do three or four, start three or four frames of queens in there before I may need to refresh the group. Yeah, and so what people, for folks that um, are not familiar with this process, what, what Mark is explaining is if you're gonna have a starter, um, it's gonna lose population. So you've gotta keep the nurse bees, um, refreshed in that starter, but you said you can get through three frames, three sessions of graphs before you have to put more bees yeah, in that box? Or I can get through about 15 to 20 days because okay. it takes about five days for a sealed a sealed, a sealed queen cell. Yeah. And so about five days apart, up to about 15, 20 days, depending upon how they act, the weather, what's going on. It, I can get three to four, four sessions out of that one box. And how many cells and how many bars and cells can you, are you talking about here? So how many queens? Cells, 40, 45 cells a frame. Times five? Times five. So you can make out of that one little five frame nuke if it's stocked correctly and you've cared for it correctly and you've stocked it with bees, you can make, who did that math? Let's say roughly 200, be, 200 queens. Yeah, you wouldn't have enough. You wouldn't have enough nuke boxes to keep going. Wow, that's pretty simple. That's a pretty simple way of. I mean, you know, when I when I do them, I won't go through all of those cycles because I wouldn't know what to do with the queen virgins I'd had. I'd have to like bring them over to your house. 
or bring them up to Byron or something. Uh, but I mean, so what, so you describe in something that's really interesting. So I'm sure we've lost some folks. Um, so let's open it up and ask and, and have folks ask us questions about this process. Uh, can I get a, a recap of that? Bill, just see if I understand it. I, you know, I raise a few Queens now and then. Yeah. So Mark, you, you use a, a nuke box and you put your graphs in there and you keep the nuke box sealed for two days and then you unseal it so the, the bees can fly. And then when the cells are sealed at day five, you put them in your incubator and you put cages on them and you're, you're harvesting virgins. You're not putting, uh, you're not putting cells in a, in a mating nuke or anything like that. You're using virgins. Yes, we, because number one, we sell virgins. Number two, we use them for insemination work. And number three, I want to see that queen before I can put her into a nuke and I can put a queen live into a nuke and they won't do anything to her. Okay, so, so yeah. you're, 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 cull you're culling the virgins. And if something isn't big enough or doesn't look right, you, you don't even bother. Yeah. Uh, with if the I bird. don't like her, she's out. Okay, right. I understand. So Jack, explain, why don't you explain um, what you're referring to with what your other option is with the queen cell? Uh, day 10 after the graft, put it in a mating nuke, which okay, is basically so, a, a couple frames of uh, sealed brood. And, you know, I use five frame mating nukes. Yes. So you're, so basically you're, you're talking about, you're using I'm using a the cells. Right queen cell, a right queen cell. A right queen cell. When when the wax has been stripped off the bottom and, yes. and you can tell that it's just the, the yeah. pupil case on the bottom of the cell. Yeah, now right queen cell is an interesting phenomenon. What's happening in a right queen cell is the bees in the colony have, um, have realized that that particular queen cell is ready, the virgin's ready to emerge from that. And they assist her by cleaning off the wax on the tip of the queen cell, and it turns to a different, usually turns to a different color. It's usually darker because what you're seeing is actually the cocoon. And it's just at the tip of the swarm, um, um, the queen cell. And then the queen will use her mandibles and make this beautiful little um, slice in that area and then flip open the top of the cell and come out. Um, so Mark is doing something different because he's looking for another, he, you, you've added, Mark's added two selection steps in his process because he's doing this stuff commercially. He's evaluating his virgins for what he has learned are properly sized virgins and healthy virgins. He's gonna take some of them and mate them naturally. He's gonna take some of them and he's gonna inseminate them. Is that true, Mark? Am I saying the right thing? Yes. Yes, we also have people that come and buy virgins so they can make them in their own field. Yeah, which is commercial, great. Commercial, we have the commercial guys that come and just take virgins. Yeah, and virgins are a great way for folks that are on this call or folks that um, want to want to make some of their own, learn at least the second half of that process is to let someone like Mark make the first half for you, which is the queen. And then you can go out and have try to mate her out of your own um, um, mating nuke. Now, Jack, you had a second part to your question. Or no, or did you? Jack just muted himself. Jack, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, Mark, uh, uh, where do you get your breeders from? Are you, are you buying? Oh, well, we're going to get into that. So we're, that's later. Yeah, we're going to get into that. Um, so, um, yeah, so Mark is uh, Mark's going to talk to you about. Um, do, are we done with the sort of like grafting piece? When we covered this at a really high level, um, we're we're establishing. I have one question, Bill. Yes, go ahead, Rob. Um, Mark, you said when you make up your uh, cell builder, you put in uh, a frame that's empty for them to have something to do. Could you say more about that? So if I don't give them a frame to work on, they're going to take these spaces that we have given them and they will fill it up with all kinds of all kinds of wax buildup 
And so when I try to go into that in two days, I'm going to have to scrape all of that compared to giving them a frame that they can build out. So that's just like a space saver in a way. Well, yes, because the young bees tend to be able to produce wax. And so they need a place to put it. And if they don't have a place to put it, they're going to find a place to put it. OK, thank you. No problem. Um, OK, so. So why don't you then um, talk about at this point, I think we all can get that the Virgin Queen, if you're going to mate them out, open mated, they call it naturally, that she would go into a little mating nuke or some kind of a mating box that you wanted to put in. Some people use five frame nukes for that also. I think Jack said he does. Um, there's lots of interesting uh, queen castles for sale in the, in the um, different catalogs. You can look at many different ways of trying to made out your own nuke, it's, um, your own queen. It's, 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 um, it's a fascinating thing for every beekeeper to try. And, um, but then there's another way that queens, that we have learned to make queens and it's by using insemination. So Mark, why don't you begin, just explain a little bit about what, now do you want me to show any of your photographs you sent me um, you sure, sure show. Okay, sure, I'll bring it. All right. So what do you what do you so talk a little bit about um, what insemination does and why would you be doing insemination to begin with? So the real reason insemination was first started is because we wanted to guarantee that a queen was able to lay correctly for a certain period of time and had the genetic material we wanted in her. And so we wanted hive A boys to have the genetic material from hive A to be from a queen from hive B. And so we've learned that we can inseminate that seminal material into her. And it took years to get to this point because four queens had to go through it live. And then we found a way to anesthetize them so they wouldn't have to feel anything and then just wake up knowing that, oh, okay, I'm all set to go. So the process we go through is we collect drones. And when we collect them, we collect the seminal fluid from them. And the problem that we found doing this is about 50% of the drones in your field do not have any reproductive material. And that's not a good sign. Because if I take a look at any of the drones that are in your field, and if half of them cannot reproduce, we're going to have a problem because any virgins flying in your field, 50% of them are not going to get mated. So basically, it's going to take 14 drones to mate with to give you the seven minimum that you need for that queen to make it through the winter. Seven is not enough queen, not enough drones, males, to get you a queen that is going to last over 12 months. And so we've basically gone through the numbers and the math to try to figure out how many drones a queen has to mate with correctly to get you the best queen to give you the best laying power to have her live the longest to produce the right amount of pheromones in a hive so she lives three four five years if you provide her the most optimal condition all right let me stop you there for a minute um mark so drones leave to go mature drones leave every afternoon when the bus comes along and it's going to take them to the <laughs> drone Bar. congregation area on their own and um and so so you're you want only mature drones when you want to extract the semen from them right yes now how do you know which drones coming back at four o'clock are mature so how do you collect drones, So when we collect drones, we show up at about two o'clock and we uh, put a queen excluder in front of the hive. Okay. And every bee is going to go right through the queen excluder back into the hive. Well, the yeah. drones are stuck because they're not going into the hive and we're standing there collecting them into okay. a drone box. And those are the poor drones that are going to get killed because, of course, once we pull out seminal fluid, they're dead. Now, no, well, I, what I'll do is I'll test them. 
you're not going to do this because I lose the seminal fluid because I'm just testing to see if the drones that are flying at the time are mature and I'll just grab their abdomen and and it'll pop it'll invert their um, evert their um, endophallus and you'll see both mucus but there's also semen in there right you have to learn how to separate the two when you extract it yes and so if you evert them the tip is going to be rounded the problem is that is not the semen it's the material that almost looks like a they call it different things i'm going to call it almost like a peach marbling effect it could yeah. be a very tiny spot or it could be the whole thing and it usually covers the area of the mucus plug so so the first skill you have to learn if you're going to do kind, any kind of insemination is to understand how you actually recover actual semen and not, you don't want a whole lot of mucus, right, in your, in your uh, apparatus. You want all semen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All semen. Inversion is not an issue because I've taught children how to do inversion. Collecting of semen and insemination are the only two components that are a little difficult and that people have a hard time. Okay. All right. So you collect the semen. What do you do? How do you store it? Uh, you're basically using a very fine glass uh, pipette that has a yeah. point on it, and you're collecting as many drones as you can. And the problem is drones peter out very quickly. So when we collect them, we try to keep them warm. And so we collect them in cages, put them back into the hive, and then we grab that cage when we collect. And as we collect, we collect as much semen as we can. And that semen doesn't have to stay warm or cold. Room temperature is fine, but we'll invert as many as we can as quickly as we can. And typically we know how much is in each syringe. And that is basically an evening job. And we'll collect enough to do as many cleans as we can. Once we're done with that, we make sure we have the right aged queens because we want them to be about five, six days old. Some people go younger than that. And then we go through the process of insemination. Yeah, so um, a couple things. <clears throat> the, the age of the queen is important, don't you think? Because um, if you try to fertilize a virgin that's too young, she has, doesn't have a full, her you know, ovarials aren't totally developed yet. So if you try to rush that process, you could end up with wasting some of your skilled insemination pieces, right? So yes. you wait for so how many days? So if you do a queen that's too early, she'll die the next day. Yeah, okay. All right, so, um, um, all right, so you got the semen and then you have the, you have the queen, but she's not gonna like this process. So take us through. And now, by the way, this is the first step where you have some control over the gen genetics of what you're going to do is that so these what we refer to them as usually queen mother colonies have you made any kind of special selection in this case like do you do you want drones from if you're doing something special say for instance do you want drones from um special colonies drone mother colonies as they refer to them yeah so we have special requests from throughout the country asking us for very specific genetics what would that what would they ask you for? Oh, ten, six years ago, people were asking for a yellow queen. They really wanted a yellow queen. <laughs> and then going, that doesn't even make any sense. Yeah. But okay, sure, we'll produce that inseminated yellow queen. Um, today everyone is looking for that gentleness, but that's ending because they're finding out that more aggressive bees tend to produce more honey. And so everyone is now pushing toward an aggressive bee. And I'm going, yeah, we've gone past that point. Yeah. So people come to you and they say, Mark, I want a queen that um, that's gentle. Maybe they, maybe they want a, a black queen or a darker queen or some other kind of color. And they ask you for these specific traits. And then you meet them, you meet that demand by selecting the drone population that you collect semen from. Correct. For my because, own circus product, we've produced a black, black queen. Yeah. Very similar to like the German black queen. The old black, yeah, the old European black bee, yeah. Um, so, um, okay. So now you've, say you've selected the right semen, you're going to get on with the process of insemination. 
and the queen is saying she has better things to do than subject herself to this. So how do you persuade her to stay still long enough so you can inject um, her with semen? And well, also, persuasion, <laughs> persuasion, is very persuasion is very easy. Persuasion is very easy. It okay. goes into a tube in one direction and backs up into another tube in the opposite direction. Okay, so how, get so, so so this you is an example. And this is an example of a over an extension. Okay. So what are we looking at here? So here you're looking at a plastic tube that has a, a conical tip, and she backed into this plastic tube. She backs into this. This sits over. If you look at the bottom, it looks like there's a plastic um, a rubber band on the bottom, but that's on the inside. Oh, and okay. That, what, that white plastic on the inside is a plastic tube that pushes out a little bit of CO2. And that anesthetizes her and allows her to basically go to sleep. What, so she's not wiggling around while we're trying to do this. The left wire that you see there is holding her in place while the one on the right is pulling on her, um, I've lost the word, um, on her stinger, which yeah. opens her up so that we can access what we need to access to be able to put in semen into the right place. Now she's not moving, there's no pain, and we're able to have enough lighting to be able to see what we're doing. And as she's not moving, this takes less than five minutes. Um, in our lab, it's taking less than a minute now. And so we're producing about five, in a five minute window, we've got these in the line. So we're producing about one per minute if I'm sitting there in front of it. So I have three of these workstations in front of me. Now, um... So this is not a process. What I'm showing here is not the insemination piece. It's just the mechanics of holding the queen in the right position so you can put the sperm in. Correct? Correct. This is the mechanics of holding her in place so that, that nothing right. is And needed. she's had CO2. Now, I mean, don't you think it would be nice of you to, um, instead of using CO2, try laughing gas or something that would like get her in, in a better mood for, but you just, they have tried many types of gases. The problem is that when queens go up into the air and mate naturally, they are um, depleted of a little bit of oxygen and have more CO2 in their bloodstream, which creates a natural process of uh, allowing them to mature correctly and allowing the body to accept everything that she's getting in during that process of mating up in the air. And so this is what we end up doing. And so there's only a certain amount of time. After she gets inseminated this day, specifically for, let's say, this queen, we put her back into the hive or a specific hive with multiple queens. Uh, the next day, we take those same queens and we give them another dose of CO2 for an additional two minutes, which start the process of having them mature so that they are able to start laying eggs quicker. There I mean, are I times think... Where, uh, I mean, I think that's incredible that um, that you're using CO2 twice, and the second time is to stimulate egg laying. There are times where we've used it three or four times because she doesn't lay. Okay, and but you can get her started with CO2. Yes. All right. You know, I just think that that's uh, that's an, that's sort of an incredible thing. You know that. Um, I, I've heard you say, hey, you know, we can just uh, gas her one more time and she'll, <laughs> and she yeah. might start laying. <laughs> but uh, um, so then you, you let them lay for a while. We let them lay. Did them, you yeah. send me a picture of, of actual um, insemination? Of actually putting the sperm in or not? Um, let's see if I can show one. I just wanted to get that one. I don't know where I put your where your photographs. Yeah, I think I did. You didn't get it. I did. I'm gonna email it to you. I'll look for it while you're while you're um, while you're talking about the same thing. I, no, I didn't. I already sent it. Yeah. So, and so at that point, oh, I know once, she goes through, once she goes through the second process of CO2, she's 
she's a queen. We mark her, we clip her wings, and she goes to a she can go to a client right then and there if someone comes to pick her up or she gets shipped. Or if the client requires, we can put them in one of our new and wait for her to start laying and show a pattern. So the answer to this might be super obvious, but let me just ask it anyway. What is it about the artificial insemination process that eliminates her instinct to want to take a mating flight or to need a mating flight? Um, so I know the answer to that. Maybe Mark does too. So um, Mark, do you want to offer an answer? No, go ahead. Um, so inside of a queen, are some what we what we think are I'm just getting this share screen up um, Jose um, is our mechanoreceptors that sense pressure on her vaginal um, area and what happens is um, once those hairs or sensors are satisfied with sperm, she loses her, uh, her, her drive to go to mating flights. So once you actually put the sperm in her, you trigger a little switch that says, I no longer be, need to be mated. Now, Mark. Um, Even after, after insemination and the two CO2, sometimes we will have a queen that will sit at the entrance that she wants to leave. But we have we have some very small queen excluders at the doors, and so there's no exit. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, that's that's interesting. I never heard that before. Very rarely we'll see it that all of a sudden she just does not want to let down. She wants out. And we'll be like, why are you sitting at the entrance? <laughs> and all the bees will be just around her sitting there, and she'll be stubborn because she won't be laying yet because she needs an extra day or so. And she will be at the entrance sitting there just trying to leave. Well, maybe that's one that you gas too hard, Mike. Yeah, March. You <laughs> All right. So what is this showing you? This is this is showing you there's both of these devices on her. There's um, the hook on the right that's holding her sting out of the way. And then there's that it's not so clear, but there's that mechanical hook holding her um, vaginal cavity open. And then there's your tube of sperm right there, right? Is that it? Right in right. here? Right, and that's what you, um, you're doing in there. So where does egg yolk come in in this process? So there has been a lot of- Or egg white, I'm sorry. There's been a, there's been a lot of training throughout the country where people know how to do this but they tend to practice with things that, such as milk substitutes or egg whites because they don't have the drones necessary or they don't prepare the class or they don't prepare for the class, which means the facility is not prepared for the class and they don't have the drones necessary or students are typically there for two days and they just can't catch on with being able to collect enough sperm. Okay. And so they'll usually tell you to try it with egg whites. Of course, it's going to kill the, the queen, but you've learned the process of the insemination. But collection of semen is just as vital. And so that's where they tell you to practice with other things. I have never learned with other things because when I was trained, they said, no, no, you got to learn this first and then we'll teach you the second component. I see. All right, let me, um, let me um, breathe. So you never mix sperm with egg white? No. Okay. The, the egg yolk component is when we have to take semen and mix it with egg yolks to uh, deep freeze. Oh, for storing it. Storage. Yes, but that, that still has problems of its own because that becomes a, an inconsistent laying pattern on the frame but it does give us the genetic platform to transfer over. So I'm sorry, I'm kind of speaking over everybody, but it gives us the transfer of genetic material, Yeah. but it does, I have to go two generations over to give you a clean pattern on a frame. I if I want to store genetic material and freeze it for multiple years 
or jump and, over multiple. Okay, I see. So you're using um, egg <clears throat> egg yolk because it's sterile. It's sterile and it gives us the necessary micronutrients and the cholesterol to keep uh, seminal it's fluid stable. Beautiful. So that's interesting. And then you can that way bank genetic material, but but the laying queen, you need to like, uh, is she, she won't be a productive queen until you then um, have a few generations of her her um, genetics, so, is that right? So her, correct, so her laying pattern will look horrible, but her daughter's laying pattern will, look will, be, will be better. Yeah, right, okay. because yeah. we will get the material into her daughters and it'll be a cleaner pattern because these sperms that have been frozen, most of the tails have been damaged. And so they never get, those sperms never get put onto an egg or they okay. end up laying that sperm with that egg, but the bees end up eating them and cannibalizing them because they think this is not a, a viable. A viable egg, yeah, okay. Very interesting. Now, um, are there anything else you want to uh, explain on these? on these uh, photographs? No, I, I just, I don't know if anyone has any questions because I don't want to confuse anyone. Most of the photos you have are, this is all the mating nuke that we have laid out. They got those side by side, right next to each other, but the queens come right back into the same box. They do, yeah. That they left from. So, you know, they, they, they orient a little bit around this box, they leave and they come right back. Yeah, we see sometimes that the ends tend to have a little bit more bees in them than the centers. So there you go. That's how um, Mark lays out his his mating nukes. All right. So um, and then and then like so, where are we going to go from here? Let's see. All right. So let's take some questions if we have any. Now there's an example of a queen that um, you like. That's the kind of pattern you want. You're looking for. Is that right, Mark? We're always looking for that pattern, even better than that. But that's not the <laughs> you know. So um, and and these are the cages you use. You use um, these are from Asia, China, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, it's a different kind of cage than than we're accustomed to, but they work very nice. I mean, I've 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 used them, and um, they hook together end to end and side to side and they also can slide you can slide them open what what do you find outside of the price what do you what else are the advantage of this kind of queen cage mark uh find it goes on the bottom there's the, the the hook on the top where i can put a um, a piece of wood to hang from the top okay basically and at the bottom once i put fondant i can open up the bottom there's a clip so it's reusable and allow the bees to eat the fondant from the bottom, giving about a day or two for the queen to get access to, to leave this. Um, I could see them, it's a clear plastic, so I could see what is going on. I could put a little bit more bees in this, or just basically uh, baby bees to assist her. They're just better. better. Yeah, well, I like them because they, um, they're they flat enough to fit between a couple frames too. Yeah. You know, and that, that makes it nice when you're trying to install them. I'm just gonna go through these photographs and if we need anything, stop me, and then we'll go back and take them. There's another picture of those um, um, frames, how you mark them. You actually got a breeder in one of them, right? Looks like to me. Yeah, those are all breeders. So every number of them is associated with the number that's on the queen. Then you'll ship them somewhere. Yep. Uh, there's another picture of a pattern. And there's this picture of your, um, when you pull your um, cell bars out of your starter. Mm hmm as right. you can see, the two top the two top bars look nice. And the bottom one, they just said, "Ah, oh, we're not going to work on it. <laughs> we're we're finished." And you've grafted, we're not work. you've individually grafted a larva in each one of them cells. Yes. So um, now, when you're bringing these bees over to your incubator, do you bring them over just like that with all of the bees on that frame, or do you? No, I'll take a very, a very gentle brush and I'll brush you, these bees off. You want all of them off, right? I will brush most of these bees off. There's always a handful of bees that will be stubborn and be in the incubator with these. Yeah. Uh, with, with the queen. All right, so um, so let's see that there's a picture of a queen there in the middle. Um, did you clip the wings on that queen? Oh yeah, she's already clipped. All right, so tell folks why you do that. Uh, we clip 
anything that stays in our field that is a uh, queen that we're testing here or we're checking out, we always clip our queens so that we know that if there's a swarm out, that that is not one of our old queens, that is a new queen or from one of our competing areas or one of one of the colleagues that we work with in the area. So um, just, you know, so for the folks that are um, thinking about this in more basic terms, so Mark has taken a little pair of scissors, held this queen by her thorax, I would imagine, and then, um, and then clipped both wings. Looks like he clipped both of them. We always clip both. If okay. you clip one, okay. they're going to fly in a circle and they're still yeah. going to end up out. Yeah, they they fly and and they fly in a circle. We you know we call, we have names from the helicopter queens, all kinds of things. When you just clip one wing, uh, and then, so that queen might leave the colony, but she'll fall down in front and not be able to move. And um, you'll have what they refer to sometimes as a puddle swarm, and you can go pick her up and put her back in the colony or do whatever you want to do with her. But the ones that are in the trees are have left with virgins. So, and it's a valuable queen sometimes and you want to keep her. And so buys you time in swarm season if you um, wanted to do that. It takes a little bit of skill to learn how to do that. Um, but, um, but Mark doesn't seem to think anything is really difficult when it comes to this. I just have to disagree with him. Awesome. So there's a top view of one of his mating nukes. And then there's a looking at a cell bar looking inside on um, the bees are working feverishly on that one. And they have decided that that's a, val um, a viable um, uh, larva and they're making a nice queen solid at. Now, if you look at the one on the left of that, you can see right here that that graph did not take, or maybe you didn't graph that one. I don't know, Mark. What well, we did not graph it. They didn't like it. They didn't like it. So they cleaned it out and, uh, or didn't use it at all. Um, okay, so there's an up close of a mating nuke, small little box, styrofoam box, beautiful little thing. And there's one of Mark's queens. Um, uh, again, um, big abdomen, um, big thorax, brown legs. All right, okay, and there's Mark. All right, I don't know what that was, but I'm gonna stop this share and let's take some questions. Mark. Uh... Question. I'm going to step out for a minute, Ralph. Well, okay. Uh, a, um, in your mating nukes, is there any yeah. issue, or with your cell builders, is there any issue with Varroa? We treat for Varroa too. Everyone has problems with Varroa. Uh, are you saying, is it an issue per se, or is it that something Does it, we treat? No, I understand you treat it. Uh, so are you saying that you're, you, would, you would be very selective with the bees that you use to make up a cell builder vis-a-vis -vis Varroa levels? Oh, no. So, so we always look for Varroa. And if there's Varroa in a hive, we won't. So you never use a hive that has Varroa in it for anything, not, not for queen rearing. If there's Varroa in a hive, then we need to know what's going on and it automatically gets treated. And we have our own protocols to treat for Varroa. So we kind of follow a, a chain of command of how we have to, treat, to basically um, keep all of our hives pretty stable. But there are hives that go heavy and there are hives that seem to never have it. Right. So do you have a particular threshold for what you would consider to be a hive that you would not use? So in other words, are you, are you saying 1%, 2%? Anything past two is going to be we just put aside. Okay, great. Thank and you. I'm going to I'm going to literally inspect that myself and take a look and go try to see what's going on after the first or second treatment. And we will we'll treat with something like oxalic acid with vaporized oxalic acid, and I'll treat every ten days for for five sessions and see what's going on. Okay, and, and is that because you're thinking that the uh, uh, because of the viruses, the health of the bees is compromised at anything above 2%? I have seen hives that had a lot of Varroa and have made it over the winter, and I have seen hives that had no Varroa and didn't make it over the winter. I, I, I think their bees are trying to learn how to live with Varroa, and we're ending up just 
kind of killing them out. I think we're all kind of lost because there's people, I, I'll have hives that are really strong and really good. And all of a sudden, just something just happens. And we have this, I have this weird feeling that we have people in the area that don't treat at all. And they are considered naturalists. And that's fine. That works. But unfortunately, we still have to work together and we all live together. And if we find a way to treat and get rid of it, it's one thing. But we have to actively do something because we produce queens. So we have to actively pursue the problem. Talking about treatment. Yeah. What we do for raw. Yeah. So, um, so now you will also, so just, just take a minute now, we're going to, we're going to sort of end pretty soon. We're on the way out now. Uh, we got a couple of minutes left, but um, explain some of what you've done with other queens that you bring into your operation. Like you select other queens from like, I don't, uh, uh, like from Byron, say for instance, who has brought in stock from VP and and maybe uh, Saskatras and all of that. So your your philosophy on your genes, your the genes lines that you carry is what? Like you carry. So I will bring in material from every location that I can find that is reliable, reasonable, and has basically looked through their own line. I brought in stuff that has Brother Adam's genetic material from Canada when it was allowed. I have brought in Saskatchewan material. Um, I have brought in Russian material. I have brought in Sue Kobe's material. I have brought in BEP's material. They're all a little different, but there's always, for, for me, there's always a necessity to diversify a genetic line. We are being bottlenecked and we're having a problem. Yeah. And so, so you for you me, want to have diversity. So you have I believe, you have, I believe in everything. Right. So if somebody gets a queen from you, they're getting um, a queen that has um, that has a lot, the lines are um, proven lines from other breeders. Some of them are varroa sensitive hygienic, some of them are bred for production. Um, but for the most part, they've been, if you introduce that gene line into your queens. You're you're building your diversity. Yes, the, yeah. the U.S. market yeah. is being probably based on 300 queens nationally, mm. and that's where all of our mothers are coming from. And that just doesn't logically make sense. If we're looking at what we think is the best, I don't really think that's just a good idea. I. I in my opinion, I think if I take a horrible queen that someone in this group may have, and I produce other queens from her, I still think we're going to get really good material out of that queen. Uh, irrespective of if someone has a, a good method of raising bees or a bad method, because I still think that genetic material is in there somewhere. But we're, we're, we're calling out so much that I don't know what's going to be left if we don't start bringing in stuff from, from Europe. And Sue Kobe is doing a great job bringing stuff in, but there's only so much she can do. And so I've tried to kind of bring in material from so many different locations. Uh, the Russians are struggling now because there's a Varroa problem there, and they're not bringing in more from Russia because there was a disagreement. And so mm -hmm. Sue is the only one left bringing in more material. This is Sue Kobe he's talking about out in California. She works, um, she has been a pioneer in bringing in um, uh, genetic material from Europe. She's got special permission to do that. Of course, you can't bring in queens because of the uh, 1922 B Act, but she has been able to persuade folks that she can bring in essentially uh, carniolan line uh, genetics. And she named her, her, initially named her stock the New World Carniolan. Um, and it has a common, it has, it's, it has, it's closer to having more carniolan genes in it than anything that we have in the U.S., of course. And uh, she's brought that line into us. And now breeders, uh, commercial breeders, unlike you, Mark, but commercial breeders who are taking just queens and making a million queens out of them are not thinking as much about the gene line. I'm sure they, if you talk to them, they'll tell you they are, but the difficulty they have is to meet the demand for queens. 
So they're in a production mode, right? And, right. Um, yeah. So, um, and and that's a completely industrial beekeeping. And what you're trying to do with uh, with your queen lines here in Connecticut locally. Um, and by the way, all of your queens are native here in Connecticut. Yes. Unless they're in we don't we don't bring in queens. If we bring in any queens, they're for our own use and we are for our own evaluation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now we got some questions um, in the in the chat. Um, one is what's the name? If they want to know what the name of your apiary is for queen purchasing, but um, I don't know what the official name of your. Why don't you just talk about you know just what is it? How do people get in contact with you if they want a queen? If you go to apifond.com, type it into the chat the box. Uh, you can go to the website and grab all the information you need. You can get a hold of us. All right. And um, um, and you have queens available. You'll have queens available. We have queens. Yeah, we will have queens. All right, we've been at this for an hour and a half. Um, we're we're at the point where we're um, pushing our luck with Mark's uh, uh, <laughs> good nature for um, being with us. So um, I did, we'll take like a minute of final question. Anybody have a final question that we can offer? I have a question. Um, sure. How much or what resources do you put in your mating nukes? Uh, the small ones or a five frame? Uh, five frame. So in the five frame, you're always going to have the, the five frame. So the center one, you want just a frame that has been worked out with wax. The two on the side, you want to have um, open cells and you want closed cells. And the two outer, you want uh, honey and pollen so that once they get started, the queen can lay in the center one and the bees will rearrange everything else on their own anyway. Once the queen starts to lay, even if you put a honey frame in the center, they're always going to start to empty out the center of that frame automatically, which immediately tells us the signal that the queen is a day away from laying it. So remember, you're talking about, and I think you, you understand this, Kirk, it's a small little frame. We're talking about, you know, the, the you're not talking, you're talking about your mating nukes, your plastic, your um, styrofoam mating nukes. They're small little frames, right? Marcus? Oh, no, no, I, what are I, you talking use, about I use five frame nukes and I use- Oh, you're talking nukes. about five frame nukes. Yeah, okay. And I use two frame nukes also. Yeah, okay. That's different. This, right? The key to any of that, the key to any of those, the mating nukes is to literally feed, constantly feed. Okay. Because they'll get pollen if there's pollen out there, but you do need to constantly feed. Yep. And that's why in the little the little mating nukes, there's a little reservoir in front where you can put syrup. Yep. Yeah. And um, but Kurt, you're talking about a full uh, five frame nuke. Yeah, I've done both, and they they seem to work. Um, you know, I've only done a, a handful of queens uh, last year, and um, probably do a little more this year, but. I, I tried both. I, I make little two frame nukes and five frame nukes. You know, five frame uses more resources, but yeah, but, um, I was actually surprised how many of them went out and mated and came back. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get 80%. 80% of them will do that. 80% of them will do that. Yeah. All right. So um, thank you. If there's nothing else, I'm going to say uh, good night to you folks. Remember, there's a, there's B talks next Thursday. So if you if you're um, if you have some lingering questions about um, anything you heard tonight, or you think about things that you want to um, discuss further about queens or anything like that, bring your questions to B talks next Thursday, and we'll continue the conversation a little bit. Um, but of course, B talks is a more uh, uh, format for more open subjects. But I want to thank Mark. Mark, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And um, I'm going to turn the recording off now so we can do say bad things or something. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop, stop the